We are talking everything you need to know about paint guns today. From the breakdown, to how do they itemize paint, to how do you spray different products. We want, by the end of this video, for you to have a very clear understanding of everything that goes into all of the different types and what best suits you. And stick around to the end, we're gonna talk about a couple problems that we've had in the past to help you guys in troubleshooting. Let's start the conversation with what different types of guns are there? We're gonna talk about the two main types. There are other types with pressure pots and stuff like that, but really for the automotive industry, you're looking at a gravity feed or a siphon feed. And although I don't have a standard siphon feed gun, this gives you the exact idea of what it is going to be. Siphon feed, meaning that it has a tube that goes down into the cup and it is going to be sucking through siphoning the air as it comes through, pulling the paint up the tube and out the tip. A gravity feed gun is exactly what it says. It is, has all of the paint above the gun and gravity is what is feeding it down into the gun and out the tip. Now, if this is your first time painting a car, let's talk about the variation of guns. Why would a guy buy a Harbor Freight gun, which is what we have here, the $25 job? Majority of the parts are, really you can't buy replacement parts. The gun's 25 bucks, throw it away and buy another one. Maybe you buy a couple of them. But let's actually talk about why you would pick one gun versus another. We have the main big name brands like Iwata and we have Sada. To me, that's like a Chevy or Ford conversation. And really it becomes what you learned on, what you know and what you feel comfortable with. It could be as simple as you guys buy guns and you check the pistol grip and you like what you feel. It's the same thing with a gun. I like the ergonomics in an Iwata and I like the adjustability in an Iwata. Me personally, that's what I like. Now, there are other guns that are fractions of the price that in my opinion spray just as nice as the Iwata. A Walcom gun, to me, is like a middle of the road gun. Walcom, and this is their very low end. They have, I think, three different tiers of Walcom guns, and this is the cheapest. I think this gun was only a couple hundred bucks. And then you have other guns from Walcom as like the middle of the road gun, um, the Combat. This one's actually made of Kevlar. But again, why would you choose one or the other? In my opinion, if you're just gonna do one or two cars, you could technically buy a gun with a couple different tip sizes. So do your research on, does the brand that you're looking at sell replacement parts, being one, because if you have a problem, are you gonna have to buy another gun, like the Harbor Freight? Or are you going to be able to buy different tips for that gun to be able to shoot different products? When you're, when you're buying a low-end gun, a cheaper gun, a majority of the time, it's because the parts inside the gun are just not well made. I mean, you have these cups that come on there and half the time they leak or they crack and it just becomes problematic. The majority of the people that paint the car the first time, they're worried about all of these things that are gonna go wrong and a lot of the time it's because they picked a very cheap gun, you're gonna get a very cheap result. Doesn't mean that you can't get a good finish out of it, because you can. I choose to use multiple guns because I like to have a variation of, if I'm gonna prime a car, I wanna use a gun that is a middle of the range. Like I like the, the Walcom cheaper guns because we shoot a lot of epoxy, we shoot a lot of VP2050, and although it's a DTM, it's epoxy based, epoxy is known to break down the coatings on these guns the chrome coatings will eventually start to tarnish and wear down. So you might want to pick a, a gun like a Walcom because this is Kevlar. The epoxy is not going to break down the Kevlar. And it's nice because it is only like a $400 gun, give or take. Doing your base coat and clear coat, I like Iwata's because Iwata, when you actually do setting changes and dial things in, you have more adjustability versus like Asada, one quarter turn is a big change and it's drastic. You can typically go to a lot of different paint shops that are selling automotive paint and they have test guns if you didn't know to that you could actually take home and try out a variation. Knowing what I know today, if I was going to start, I would buy a cheap. And I say cheap, it's a two to $400 range Walcom primer gun. 
and I would buy uh, four to six. You can spend $800 if you want, but I personally like the Supernova. This is a really good gun to itemize paint. Later in this video, we will talk about what size tips. That way you guys dial in exactly what you need. Let's start with the components of the gun. We are going to be using what I like. This is purely my opinion, and some may like it and some may not. This is a PPS system. The PPS system comes off the gun with a simple twist, and what it has is it has a lot of really good features that you may not have with a cheaper gun. A lot of people don't want to buy these because you have to buy a liner and the lid as a kit, and that becomes a little bit costly, but you do have all of the measurements on how you're going to mix your paint right on the cup. This Harbor Freight gun does not have all those mixtures. So you're still gonna have to buy plastic cups with the mix ratios or use a scale. Secondly, you're going to have to get filters. I, I still recommend filtering all of your paint regardless, but this does have a filter and these come with different whether you're, you're shooting solvent-based or whether you're shooting waterborne, they have different micron filters in the lid built in. So it's really nice to be able to drop in your liner, mix your paint, put your lid on, and now you have something that is already mixed to the right ratio and you have a filter. The other thing is these seal really well where a lot of times you are going to be dealing with as the paint goes down inside, this liner will collapse and you don't have to worry about any air that has to get in. The benefit there is that if you're comparing it to a cheap Harbor Freight gun, this has a very small weep hole and as the paint comes down, it has to allow air to come in. Well, think about that. You've got to get into tight areas and spray with your gun, that paint keeps splashing up against the inside of this cap. And depending if you're shooting primer, it's thick and it plugs that hole. Now your finish is compromised because you are fighting that air being trapped and it now stops and it will not allow that gravity to flow through the gun. So that's the biggest difference between having a cheaper gun and the PPS setup. However, why would we not go with a siphon setup? It's the same kind of concept. When you're using different materials, maybe they're thicker primers or maybe they're really thin waterborne products, that paint is getting siphoned. So that air comes up the gun and goes across and it's siphoning the product up into it. Again, there's no liner that comes up into this. So you have a very small weep hole. If that weep hole gets plugged at any point, you're going to get paint that just will stop spraying. And if you're in the middle of the end of your paint project and now you've got orange peel or maybe the paint job starts out really nice and you can't figure out why it gets less and less product, it's nine times out of 10, it's that little weep hole and your product is too thick and it just plugged it. That's why I have always steered clear of these. I started painting with those and let me tell you, they. The gun is bulky, it, you can't get in areas, you start bumping your car, it's just frustrating. All of these things combined adds to your frustration of why that car is, is such a pain to paint. We're trying to streamline all of these things into why that they matter. The next thing is when it comes to the adapter. The adapter, if you're gonna run a PPS system, each adapter is different, they have Certain adapters fit a variety of guns, but you have to know what gun you're gonna buy and what PPS adapter that you need to get for that thread of the gun. If you're looking for what adapter to get, you can typically go to any of your paint manufacturers. I know I go to a, a local place and I just tell them what gun I have and they will hook me up with exactly the part number that I need for that gun. Let's dive into the actual body of the gun and how the paint goes through the gun and gets itemized. The paint goes through your PPS adapter, your cup directly into your gun. And then once it's in, you have a needle. That needle, it's in a direct line straight to the tip of the gun. But if you take the end of that off, you have a spring, pull the trigger back, you can then remove the needle. 
all this is doing is in the body of the front of the gun, the paint is just sitting in there, just like it is in the cup. At that point, the tip of this cone needle is sealing off inside of the tip. We're gonna get into the tip size later, but all you need to know is that when this trigger is not being depressed and it's just in its natural state with the spring pushing it up against, no paint is allowing to come out of the tip. If you had no air pressure, it would just dribble down and drip all over the bench. So how do we itemize it? We have the lower section where the air comes in. That air is pressurized, it comes through, and we have a fan adjustment. This fan adjustment is just regulating how the air is brought through the tip of the gun. Whether it's a wide fan, if you have this all the way out, your fan is wide and you can adjust that to a bullet. That is the only function of this area for the fan. As far as the needle goes, as you pull back, it is allowing the paint to come out of the tip and the pressure of the air is shooting it out of the gun instead of letting it fall directly on the bench. That is pretty much the basic operation of any typical gravity fed gun. If you want to not fight that big bulky gun and we're talking about what components do you actually need so you can get into areas, you need a fitting that is going to go into your gun and I like to use a swivel. That way you are have the ability to instead of have something that's rigid and now you're going to try to get into a jam or an area, you can actually pivot this and keep the cord up over your shoulder. I like to use a swivel. I believe this one is made by DeVilbis. You can get these again, any most paint supplies, you can probably even get them on Amazon. Where this connects to the gun is just a quarter inch NPT thread fitting. And I have rigged it to where I can run the fittings that I want. You can do a variation. If your gun has a male fitting to a female, you can technically go directly into the reverse side. But depending on what regulator setup you want, I am using a diaphragm regulator. There's a couple different regulators that you can choose and why would you pick one versus the other? A diaphragm regulator, the diaphragm inside of here will actually regulate the air pressure through the gun more steadily than a standard regulator. These regulators tend to be a little bit more touchy. They also don't have anything that's going to lock that pressure. So if you are painting and maybe your arm bumps this, it's gonna change your air pressure. And now that last pass you wanted to do just went higher or lower air pressure. Where this diaphragm, you have to actually pull the knob up, make your adjustment. And then when you get the air pressure that you like, which you are going to be setting your air pressure while you are pulling the trigger just for air, not back for paint. And what that air pressure is, is the pressure at the gun. And then you can push the knob down and that is going to lock that. So now when you bump it, it's not going to change. The biggest reason that I like the diaphragm is that when you are pulling the trigger on and off, you're not gonna have as much of a drop and change in air pressure. It will regulate the pressure through the gun a little bit more even than a standard regulator will. One other thing I wanna to touch on is a good water separator or particulate filter. These filters are great for your garage guy, DIY guy. I have the paint booth and I have a very nice SADA setup that we have on there that goes through a variation of filters and separators. So I don't have to have that right at the gun. But if you guys have a standard air compressor that is going to accumulate different humidity and have water in the tank that is oily, that is going to pass through your airline and end up at this point, which is usually mounted right before your regulator. The reason is you don't want all that contamination and oil in your paint. It is directly going right at the tip of your gun and ending up in your paint. And that's what's causing fish eyes and different issues with oils. This is like a last resort. If this is all you got is a standard 30 gallon and you're trying to paint your car, get yourself one of these cheap filters. It's a nice, good thing. The only reason that the fish eye filter is a little bit better is you can actually replace the filters inside and keep reusing this cartridge 
and it actually catches, I would say, more than your standard throwaway filter. The only thing that I don't like is that it's a little bit longer than the standard. So for me, sometimes that matters in a roll cage or where I've got to get into a tight area. But that is your last line of defense. Let's talk about how you set this gun to zero. The majority of the people that we teach in our classes, and if you guys want to know how to do this stuff in person, check out sylvesterscustoms.com where we periodically update when we're going to have classes here at the shop. But when you set this gun to zero, what is that? That is a lot of guys that I teach are painting a car, maybe it's their first time, maybe it's their 10th time, but they never really understand why maybe that paint job got a bunch of runs, why that paint job looks modely, why there's tiger stripes, why it itemized different. Well, what is itemization? It's the droplet size that comes out of the gun and hits the panel. So how do you set up your gun so you can be efficient? we be consistent with every single thing we do. So as simple as maybe I used this cup and I liked it, maybe I didn't and I switched it up. But track everything. Track what gun, what day, what humidity, what temperature it was because those things are going to change the way that you mix your paint. You have to find what you like through test panels, through testing. And when you're setting a gun to zero, the first action of these, these are dual actions. So the first time you pull back on these triggers, it is just air. And then at the end, you have the needle that is seated in the tip. When that is at the beginning, that needle needs to be set at zero. This is the needle directly in line. You are going to screw that all the way in. So if this needle is all the way in, it is sealed at the tip, and when I pull back, that movement is just air. There is no paint coming out. On the end, you're either gonna have numbers or a line, and you can actually count how many turns out that the needle has. Write all of these things down. How you adjust the gun, you would, I would say, take either a scrap hood, fender, a piece of paper, put it on the wall in your garage or in your paint booth, and you're gonna do a pass. I like to say use a panel because the paper texture is going to give you a little bit different representation than what it's actually going to look like on a very smooth panel. And you are going to make a pass and you are going to count how many turns out until you get the finish that you prefer. The, the fan. I like to start with the fan all the way out if I, and then one turn in. That's just what I like for this gun. Why? Because I want to get the most even coverage but I also don't want a whole bunch of tail solvents and overspray everywhere, so I usually bring it in one turn to just narrow it up a bit. Use whatever you guys like, but the thing is, track it. And then the other component of that is your air. What air pressure are you setting? Well, did you read your TDS sheet for that product, and what does it recommend for air? What kind of gun does it recommend? Most of them are an HVLP, which is what this is, and we like to shoot anywhere from 25 to 35 PSI depending on the product. I write every one of those things down so that way it is repeatable. If I did my paint job and that fender came out good, then I can go right back to the exact same settings, exact same paint mixture, and I can produce the exact same result. If you are willy-nilly not setting up your gun and knowing what those things are, you are going to get a very drastic difference because every time you paint and you pull back on that trigger, if you set this, you can pull back all the way on that trigger and this is a stop as to how much paint is coming out consistently every time you pull it. As you paint the car, you're gonna stay on the air the whole time until you stop painting. But if you're doing a whole panel, keep your air on and pull back and whisk away at your ends and that way every pass has the same amount of mils of paint and it has the same exact finish. When it comes to the itemization, so the actual droplet of paint, when it gets blown out of the tip of the gun into that fan and it hits the panel, if you change the air pressure, you are changing the size of the droplet. The higher the air pressure, the smaller the droplet. The lower the air pressure, the bigger the droplet. Do not mistake that for dry spray. 
Dry spray is where something has so much air pressure, the fact that it's a small droplet means that it's going to be going down drier and it's going to dry faster versus a bigger droplet that takes a little bit longer to flash off and dry. So you want to find the happy spot that you like for your gun and just go with what works. We're gonna show a demonstration where as we adjust the gun, and if you have too much air pressure, you guys have probably seen paint jobs that look splotchy. It's because the air pressure was too high and that paint job just looks splotchy. It's hard to wrap your head around what that itemization looks like. So here's a demonstration of what that is. And you will also see that when we come back with a lower air pressure that those droplets become more uniform and everything looks nice and, and even. What we typically do when we spray a complete is that we spray the car and we do about three good coats for coverage, making sure that you can't see through the base coat or the single stage, whichever you prefer, and that it's not thin and it's even. And then at the end, if you're shooting a metallic, I will turn my air pressure all the way back between 12 and 15 PSI and I get back and I do a little bit more of an overlap so that way all the droplets are very even and very smooth and you don't start seeing the splotchiness. If you spray your car in base coat and it looks splotchy before you clear, you just have to know that it is not going to look any different when you clear that car. We have covered the fan, the needle, and the air pressure. But there's some other components that you're gonna to wanna to take into consideration when you buy a gun, and it's the tip size. The tip size is basically your hose. How big is the hose and how much product? Your product, now whether you are spraying a thick primer, maybe it's a high build primer like a polyester or a VP2050, I like to shoot with a 1.8 to a 2.0 tip because that product's viscosity, meaning how thick it is, has to be able to pass through that tip. Now, primer being thicker, or maybe you're shooting flake through a dry flake gun, the tip that comes out of the end of this thing is absolutely massive. 2.0, this thing, I don't even know what size that is. It is a hose. It is blowing the flake size. And the reason that I bring up the Flake King is because some guys are shooting flake through a mid coat as part of their paint process and you have to take into consideration the size of the flake. Does it actually pass through the tip? And when I say you're putting flake into a mid coat, mid coat is basically a clear base coat and you are just adding that flake into the gun. But if you're using a 1.4 tip in your spray gun, that will just clog. So you're just pre-planning and thinking about what is the product? Is it gonna flow through the tip? Your primers, again, 1.8 to 2.0 is sufficient. And if you're shooting base coat, I would say a 1.3 to a 1.4 is sufficient. And you can also compensate for the gun. How does it spray? Do you need to add more paint or not? So let's just use an example of a 1.3 to a 1.4. Maybe you want a little bit more mills. Maybe you're shooting clear coat and you're gonna cut the car with 600 and you need to make sure that your mills are thick enough and that clear. Well, you can open up that needle or you just do more coats to make sure that you compensate for that tip size. But 1.3 to 1.4 is gonna cover base coat, clear coat. It's gonna also be able to spray single stage. Just make sure you read your TDS and that all of your products are mixed per that TDS. As we go through the process of cleaning our gun, no matter what gun you have, if you don't take the time and care to make sure this thing looks close to new as you can every time, it's going to be problematic. We talk about the consistency. If any one of these components starts becoming built up with paint, clogged, it's not going to spray the same every time. When you remove the cap, we are just basically taking everything off. That is our cap. This is our tip. As you remove the tip, right on the side of the hex is usually where the tip size is found. In this case, a 1.4. We are then going to remove the back cap for the needle and the spring. 
and when we pull the trigger, our needle comes out so where we can remove our needle. There's a couple other things about this gun, and as the needle goes through the end of the gun, there's a packing in here. It's hard to see, but that little nut that's right on the back side of the gun, there's a small packing. And that packing over time, as you pull back and that needle's going back and forth, it's going to wear out. So it's also important to always make sure that after you've cleaned and wiped off the needle and you have sprayed out the gun, that you inspect that packing. You don't want it to be so tight that that spring is not going to work good for the needle going back and forth. I personally like to use brake cleaner. This is the brand CRC that I like because it seems to clean the best but use whatever brake cleaner that you guys like. The thing is, brake cleaner being that it evaporates really fast, you're not gonna have anything in brake clean that's going to contaminate your paint. I have been doing it for 27 years using the same dang thing. The other thing we're using is we're using a cup of acetone, you guys can use lacquer thinner, and a toothbrush. These are specific paint cleaning kits that you can get. It's not just a standard toothbrush, most average toothbrushes will just melt but we are going to make sure that we are cleaning and inspecting every little orifice and the reason that I like using the brake cleaner versus just scrubbing it with acetone is because I am shooting it through each one of these little tiny orifices and I am checking it against the light to make sure that I don't have any paint buildup in there. I also don't recommend I've seen guys using uh, the needles that you use to clean out like a MIG gun and those things will actually start to file those holes bigger and the gun will not spray the same. But you're just looking to make sure that everything is open and by spraying this through it, you can verify that. Any excess buildup on the outside, we're just going to scrub it with the brush and the acetone and because this stuff is a bit expensive, we just spray it off at the end and wipe it down with a paper towel. As we start to put it back together, we're inspecting the tip. We are making sure that the tip is going to be clean and free of any paint. I like to use Q-tips. You guys can use some of those bristle brushes in the kits that they have for sell the guns, but I like the Q-tip. And then the other thing is there's a bunch of small holes and orifices on these tips. That way the air can pass through. If those start getting clogged and you have paint in there, then you're going to run into problems. This is where, these are the typical parts that the Harbor Freight's guns don't seal good. They, you can't get replacement parts for. So this is why this is important to make sure these things are very clean. I spray the gun out really thoroughly, the body of the gun, making sure that down in the gun is just as clean and it should look like new all the time. Once the body of the gun is completely clean, I like to put the tip back in. If you just did this finger tight, you will also have air that sucks in and it's not going to spray the same. It needs to have just a snug tight and then our air cap. Our air cap, once it is snug, you have the ability to also, if we didn't talk about it before, change the horns. These horns are going to be the direction of your fan. If air is coming out of each horn, it is pushing the paint flat and if you need to get in a door jam you can go this way up and down and if you need to do the length of the car you can flip it back sideways and now you're going laterally. The other thing I talk about that packing wearing out if you don't use needle lube um, the one that I like is the Devilbus and the reason that is is it's a little bit thicker we have bought the needle lube from Iwata and it works but this stuff seems to work a little better it keeps that packing nice and lubricated. And when you actually shove that through, that lubricant is specific for a gun. Don't be using a regular oil because it's gonna have silicone in it and it's going to give you tons of fish eyes. The last thing you want is to contaminate your paint right before it comes out of the gun. We want to be putting the spring back over the needle in the cap. And after that, you're pretty much done. I scrub the whole gun down, wipe everything down to make sure I don't have any paint or overspray. I'm very particular about my guns. 
Your tools are only going to be as good as you take care of them. So maintenance is key. Now that our gun is clean, let's talk about the troubleshooting. You guys have been spraying or you're about to spray and maybe you're gonna run into these problems and it's things to look out for. If the gun started spraying good and it starts to not, a lot of times, if you're using a cheaper gun, we kind of touched on this, if those little holes for the orifices on the siphon feed or even the cheaper caps, if those plug, then it is for sure the paint is not going to flow through the gun. The other thing is, a lot of guys shoot polyester primer. Polyester primer, in a sense, is liquid body filler, and it kicks a lot faster than the majority of primers. So polyester primer, back when we used to use it, I used to always have problems where I would be spraying and it's a summer day, and that would start to harden, and the viscosity of poly starts to kick really fast and next thing you know you start it out with a lot of paint as you start to spray it will start to harden inside the gun inside the cup and the thicker that it gets the more that it will not spray a way around polyester if it's a warm day is every time you go to fill that cup up clean the gun do not mix up a big batch of polyester only mix up the cup size that you're actually spraying at a time because you will have problems it's one of the many things, the reasons that I don't like polyester primer, but again, consistency. If you change five things about what you're spraying, you're not gonna know what worked and what did not work. If you're troubleshooting a problem while you're spraying, check one thing at a time. Are you getting the sufficient air pressure? If that air pressure dropped, you know, you, we're writing it down. We're notating how many turns. Did the turns change? Did your air pressure change? Is the compressor keeping up? As you're spraying, is the CFM in your tank dropping? Is the tank big enough? And you're monitoring all of these things one at a time, checking them off the list. If you pull the trigger for a quick check and you have the same air pressure, we can check that off the list. If you pull the cap, can you see through it? Do we need to do a quick clean? Sometimes it's as simple as removing the cup cleaning out the tip and the cap, and check it again. If that's not it, it's likely your paint product is either too thick, or it's not mixed right, or it's kicking. Maybe it's just too hot. A lot of those problems come in polyester primer. And I think that's why a lot of guys get frustrated because if you think about it, you spray epoxy, that goes pretty good if you're even doing epoxy. Some guys are doing their body filler over bare metal, and they go directly to polyester. Polyester can be very finicky because it kicks so fast, and especially if you're mixing up a big batch, and then people are already frustrated with their gun because it doesn't spray right. But if you know those, those few basic things with the hole in the cap, things getting plugged, insufficient air, are you getting a fisheye? Do you have a, a fisheye filter? Do you have a water separator at the gun? If you do not do this all the time, those are an awesome thing to do. Can you buy fisheye eliminator? You can. I personally don't recommend it. When I first started painting and learning in my dad's garage, I was using fisheye eliminator in everything, and it was as simple as buying a new airline because it was the same airline that my dad had used in his shop for 30 years, and it was full of the oil from the compressor tank. So use a dedicated airline for your new paint job because that oil takes a little bit of time to work its way through to your gun so that filter is a last line of defense. Those are just a few of the things, but those are the common ones that will mess up your paint job. If you guys like this video and you want a little bit more in depth on your particular project step by step, check out the video where we cover a 63 Lincoln and we go over all of the steps to paint that car. Hope you guys enjoyed this. Please like and share with a friend and we'll see you guys on the next one.